<coughs> Why do infectious diseases make us feel sleepy, cause pain, fever and inflammation? How is it possible that the same infection can cause different degrees of sickness in different people? making one person seriously sick and the other just a little unwell. And how is it possible that the same infection in the same person can cause different degrees of sickness at different times? <coughs> my entire interest in this whole area came to me uh, when my, uh, my children um, started going to daycare. Immediately after one or two weeks, they come back and they're very sick with some respiratory infection, which are very common in daycares, and all children go through them. We first try to assess which pathogen the kids are infected with. We do some you know, research of symptoms and um, potential cause. So that makes you think, why do they even need to feel that sick? Because this is not caused by pathogen, it's caused by the immune response. We actually don't really understand sickness behavior at all. We don't even really understand fever, which is uh, something that is so obvious that everybody has during an infection. It's thought that sickness behavior may have something to do with uh, getting rid of uh, the in, uh, infectious uh, pathogens. Uh, but I think that sickness behavior probably has mostly to do with our ability to tolerate the presence of infection. We try to avoid getting infected, and that's why there are certain smells that we find repulsive, because they indicate that, for example, food is spoiled and we would not eat it. During an infection, we basically can use very different strategies to deal with infections. We can try to get rid of a pathogen, and that's what the immune system does. That strategy is called resistance. The immune response itself uh, is destructive in nature, and it often causes collateral damage. So immunopathology is basically all the aspects of disease during an infection that are not caused by pathogen, but caused by the immune response itself. The strategy of tolerance allows us to tolerate the presence of pathogen. That strategy is not a function of the immune system, it's a function of the rest of the organism. And it allows us to, for example, protect our tissues from the damage caused by pathogen or by the immune response and allows to uh, efficiently repair these changes and allows our, uh, the rest of our physiological systems to adapt to the presence of infection and ultimately that's what promotes our health and survival of infections. The way we approach the problem of uh, resistance and tolerance is basically a very general concept of the three ways you deal with any problem. For example, if there's a very loud music that you don't like and it bothers you, you can first try to avoid it by uh, going into a different room. But if you can't, then maybe you can try turning off the music. And if you cannot do that, then you can try to tolerate the presence of the music, for example, by putting headphones on. It doesn't matter how loud the music is or how bad the music is, it's still fine. First, we try to avoid getting infected. And if that doesn't work, our immune system, of course, tries to get rid of the pathogen. And if that doesn't work, we also try to tolerate the presence of pathogen. So the question that I'm planning to address in the future, uh, especially with the support of Els Corner for Senior's Award, has to do with uh, some basic biology of infection, infection process and infectious disease. And that will require actually studies that would go far beyond the area of immunology because mostly all aspects of sickness behavior are controlled by a very small area in our brain called hypothalamus. It's like a control center for the entire organism. It uh, controls our appetite, sleep, temperature, and, and controls everything. And it's these changes in that control center that lead to sickness behavior. And so we want to study how these changes happen and what's their role. I will probably have seven to eight people specifically working in that area. And they will be working on very different aspects, but they will be connected by this big question. When one visits his lab, one sees a community of scientists at all stages of career. They come from all over the world. They, they come with different backgrounds, but they're working together. It's a lively place, it's an exciting place. 
and people are being challenged to do their best work. We do interact most of the time. We do not necessarily work together at the bench. What he likes to do is to give us independence within our little area of research so that we can be as creative as we can without interfering with somebody else's work. And everybody brings different strengths to the table that you can actually discuss about, I understand how cellular signaling works, this person understands a little more how physiology of the liver works, and together we can actually do something and combine our forces to understand things better. Specifically, I focus on how chronic activation of the immune system can affect metabolic homeostasis. What I'm trying to understand is how cells initiate appropriate immune response to infection without causing too much tissue damage and too much immunopathology while doing so. How signals produced by cells that are undergoing some type of malfunction can actually activate the inflammatory response. Concurrent infection of influenza and bacterial lung infections. He's usually there to bounce around ideas with and to talk about things, but he's never going to be the one to tell you you must do this and not do this. He'll let you really pursue anything that really interests you. He loves to talk. He likes to talk about science, and he's available at any time. Personally, I'm so excited when I do some experiment that I, I run to his office right away and I show him my data, say, what do you think? What? He's really open to discuss with his students. My preference is definitely in hypothesis-driven research. People who are very creative realize that they just need to make many hypotheses and that most of them will be wrong. And I think that's the part that most people cannot really accept uh, easily. If your hypotheses are very simple and very boring, then you will be right more often, but it's not going to be uh, very creative. Ruslan is a, a very much a person that uh, bases what he does in science on a conceptual underground. He's very much a thinker of big concepts. He sees the world in terms of those big concepts and he communicates that to the people he works with. Ruslan is in many ways a very modest person. So he's quiet and he listens carefully but he doesn't hesitate to jump into a conversation with new ideas. Really, honestly, even without being my husband, I, I, I can say that from um, the bottom of my heart, that he's really a unique scientist. I, I think that the fact that this is a one-time one 25th anniversary award the Foundation chose to give this to Ruslan Medzatov is an incredible uh, honor and an acknowledgement of everything that he's done. We want to understand how immunopathology can be managed without interfering with a successful defense against infections. How to manipulate the host physiology or host immune response in such a way that it can still get rid of infection but minimize the damage it can cause and to minimize uh, the expression of the, um, all the various symptoms of infectious disease. And from there we hope to find new ways to fight infectious diseases and to more efficiently recover a healthy state. Yeah!